Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding in quarantine on air with my co-founder, Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else. And it's actually, no, it's not going great. It's going fantastic because we actually just got news that everything pretty much in Texas is going to start to open up when? May 1st? Yes. Is that what you're just saying? Yep. My... This is you and I reunited. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yep. and so, it's, so it's expiring on Thursday. So uh, we hope everyone is staying safe out there. Hope everyone is having um, a great day. Thank you so much for bearing with us in, on this quality of the podcast that we've been uh, putting out over the air. I know it's not as good as it normally is when we're sitting next to each other, but you know, Desperate time calls for desperate measures. So we're just happy that we've been able to keep up with the content. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us on YouTube, uh, hit that subscribe button, thumbs this video up, bringing you guys a ton of new content, having a lot of fun doing it. And then of course, if you're listening on the podcast side of things, uh, a rating and review, it just goes such a long way for Jeff and myself. So we really appreciate it. So today is Monday, Monday fun day. And that calls for a Q and A uh, from the podcast and uh, people that have commented stuff on YouTube. So we'll go through all the questions on Twitter first, and then I will pull uh, the YouTube comments. We have a lot of comments to get through or questions to get through. So maybe give a little bit more than the cliff note response, um, but we'll, we're happy to get through it. So first question says, how do you think about using multiple strategies in one portfolio, like owning mostly high quality type companies, but maybe 20 to 30% are net nets and or special situations? Uh, I think that's a great idea. Um, we may do something like that. We'll say in the um, fund mostly. Uh, I think the the main thing that we do is my preference is for you know the coffee can portfolio, the finding something that you can buy and you can um, uh, leave in your portfolio for almost an unlimited amount of time. But it's hard to find enough of those, and so we do have some things that we might want to hold for shorter periods of time. Is the most likely ones would be net nets. Special situations are also good. I think I've talked before, like for me historically, and this is true I think for a lot of value investors things that have really worked are buying above average businesses and above average industries at low prices, often about 10 times what you think normal earnings are. If like say 15 or something is a, is a more average price for a stock um, buying net nets. And then in terms of special situations, we look at spinoffs in the past. I've also done things. If people are interested in them, you should probably read Ben Graham, but related hedges have worked for me. Related hedges are when you do two things, uh, two, uh, two positions in the same capital structure, basically, and, and other merger arbitrage and stuff like that. And some things having to do with litigation and things like that. Those three categories, really, or we can include spinoffs as another category, have all worked for me. But they're all kind of random when something shows up. And when I say work, like, you know, you can look up how Ben Graham did, how Warren Buffett thinks he did, but often 10 percentage points a year better than the market. So they do work. Things like net nets can do 10% better, but there are years where there's like no net nets. And then there's other years where it seems like there's no good special situations um, or there's just, for whatever reason, convertible preferred stock and a common stock are not trading at prices that would allow you to do related hedges. So it kind of happens randomly. But I think that's a good idea to have three or four different reliable things that are proven value investing strategies. And when you can't find something smart to do in the area that you're in, do one of those other proven things with the rest of your portfolio while keeping that core of the businesses you really like to hold permanently. But usually I can't fill up 100% of a portfolio with businesses I want to keep forever. So things like net nets do come into it. Good answer. And for everyone that isn't familiar, what is a coffee can portfolio? Did I read about that? Was it in 100 baggers or 100 to 1? Probably. It was in one of those because the the 100 baggers is basically based on just a redo of the... the uh, 100 to 1 in the stock market. But uh, the coffee can portfolio was written up as a journal article at one point, but I think it is referenced in those. And the idea basically is just buy a stock and hold it forever. I've talked about that. I think for individual investors, that's an alternative for indexing. It's never going to give you the highest possible returns ever. Like what uh, if you look at what Buffett did or something, even in great investments, usually selling after like 10 years does get you a better compound return than say holding for 30 years. But if you find a really good business, just buying it and forgetting that you own it, not going out and buying more or selling it, you know, not fooling around with the position does work really well if you find the right business. It's just there's so few of those businesses that we find. And we also follow the Charlie Munger approach, which maybe isn't rational, which is that we'll buy, we insist on a really low price when we buy a stock we like. 
but we will allow it to kind of go up a ways. So like he might have bought Costco at what he thought was a really good price, but he doesn't just sell it because it gets to an expensive price, you know, and that's the coffee can approach. You bought it at a really good price. It does sometimes get to maybe a high PE, but since you still love the business, you hold on to it. You don't fool around with it. But is that a problem? I mean, Buffett's long talked about how he wished he would have sold Coca-Cola, for example. I mean, how do you, I guess, handicap whether it is truly a coffee can stock or one that you should sell and look to redeploy that capital elsewhere? I think for individual investors who the alternative is like indexing or something, it should just be a coffee can. Just buy it and hold on to it forever. Don't Really don't worry about it. I've suggested that many times to people that um, putting all of your savings from one year into one stock and then never adding to that stock again and putting all your savings into a totally different stock the next year is an approach that you can use instead of indexing if that makes you feel more comfortable. Uh, for some people, it will make them feel more comfortable. For others, it won't. It depends on your background. Um, but I think that for people running a fund like we do or for Buffett, it is true that we can look at the numbers and say, okay, at 50 times earnings, this is a little crazy and you should sell this and buy something else. Usually the way to solve that problem is to look at the 10 year forward expectation for a stock. And Buffett would have known that Coca-Cola had terrible expectations for the next 10 years if you do the math on it. You know, if it falls from a P of 50 or 60 or whatever to 20, that even with the best expectations for what the business will do, you're going to end up with negative or no returns over 10 years. So, um, I think that for professionals and stuff, yeah, they cycle through faster, but that still doesn't mean that, I mean, for a lot of people holding for almost 10 years is like a coffee can portfolio compared to what they normally do. Um, I think of net nets as something that we trade, but the truth is (laughs) we won't sell them within a year of buying them. So I don't know how many traders think of a year as the minimum time for a position. Uh, But I just mean it's different than, than when I'm talking about like holding forever. Got it. Uh, Next question. Given the emphasis you place on strong historical financial performance, how do you avoid passing on companies that have ugly historical results, but have undergone a fundamental change or which have strong unit economics, but are currently loss making? That's a really good question. And it's one I have a lot of trouble um, not making that mistake. So I have made that mistake a couple times where I thought a business was going to get much better. And I should have bought it. And I did not. And it's usually pretty simple stuff about it. I actually talked a little bit about this because I just written up for the website, um, uh, Otis, the elevator company. And I mentioned that there are some things about that business that reminded me a little bit of Rollins, which is a pest control company. And um, uh, it's Orkin. And uh, and um, Brinks, which is an armored car company. And when I looked at both those companies at totally different times in their history, they both looked like they were underperforming their potential and that with some small changes and things, they've become much more efficient. And I like the industry and stuff. And I really, if they had already proven that they could kind of turn around, I would have bought them, but I didn't. And the gains that you could have from that was probably pretty big. So I would say I've made that mistake before. Um, And it has usually been things like that. Things like... um, whether it's root density or, or really simple stuff about it like that. Um, so I think it's something that's hard to get over. Uh, I actually talked a lot about Transcat before. Transcat is a company that hasn't shown up in the numbers yet, what I think they're transforming themselves into, which I think is very attractive. So I think the easiest way to do that is to look at the successful stories in the industry. Because like I said before, I think an industry is about 50% of what your results are going to be in a um, company. So if you see a company that seems to be doing a smart turnaround thing and it's in a great industry, then I get really interested in it. If I think they're doing a great turnaround and they're in steel or something, probably not as exciting. But if they were in like, um, I I don't know, like armored cars or something, which I could see peers and how efficient they were, then I should probably pay more attention to that. So if it's in a great industry and it's starting to do the smart things, then you should do that. For one book that everyone should read about this kind of thing is Railroader. You read Railroader road, and see how the same person went from one railroad to another and turned them all around. Um, that was Hunter and, Harrison, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and and I've mentioned that before. I even mentioned it's in something like Tandy Leather or something, that there's some stuff about Tandy Leather, Leather's recent performance, which would suggest um, that if they had the right changes internally, they could be a lot more profitable. Um, and you can sometimes see that in things like railroads or something. But you know, so it, it depends. But the answer is that I would look for a really good industry first. I don't know how to pick it for a business that hasn't been proven. 
you know, like an Uber or Lyft or something, are they going to become great businesses? Maybe, but we don't have any other, um, like example of that happening in history yet. They're the first ones. So I don't know how to do that, but I could probably do it by picking a company that is getting better in an industry. I already understand to be good. Cool. Uh, is it a good time to back up the truck on USO? That's your, that's your answer. Oh, that was, yeah, that was my answer. <laughs> you know what show this is? I, I've seen the show. That is The Office. There you go. There you go. What are yeah. your thoughts on USO? What are my thoughts? I don't have anything. Are, is USO an ETF, an oil ETF or something? What yeah, it? yeah, that's exactly what yeah. it is. Uh-huh. No, I, I don't have any thoughts on that. And actually, you probably know this, but I be very cautious about ETFs and things because the structure of what they're actually betting on isn't always what people think they're betting on. So I, I don't like, like people talking about bond ETFs and stuff. And I try to explain that sometimes what they're buying is not actually the same as what they think they're buying because it depends on what they're doing and we're rolling things over and stuff. So I'd be very careful. Yeah. Um, let's see. Would you say translation services do a good job of translating financial statements of foreign companies or would learning the original language of say a Japanese company um, help more with reading their financial statements? Uh, I think they do a pretty good job generally. I think that all the ones I've seen do much worse job with Asian languages than they do with European languages. European languages are very good. Um, like translation of French into English or something is pretty much perfect except for syntax problems. Um, so, uh, like they'll put the irrelevant part of the sentence in the part in the English sentence that would be highly relevant or something. So it just is misordered sometimes. But, um, other than that, I think they're very good. So European stuff is very easy to do. The biggest problem for me always though, is, um, actually the business culture. It's not the language barrier and it's not the accounting barrier. I can get over those. They explain how they account for stuff so I can figure that out. And it's not the language barrier, really. The big problem is that the culture is actually different in some places. So understanding what it means when a Japanese CEO says something versus when an American CEO says something has proven to be difficult sometimes for me. Got it. Um, What do you make of the data where they show number of Robinhood accounts that own a stock? Is that useful information? Uh, no, is Robinhood that free brokerage <laughs> thing? What is Robinhood? Uh, yeah, that's exactly what that is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. This answer is no. Um, will there be second and third downturns in the market or is this act or is this time actually different because of the money printer and cause of the destruction being a disease? Uh, this is the most negative I've ever been on the stock market. I'm not going to say more than that, but it's the most negative I've ever been in my 20 some years of investing. Um, best technical indicators. Do you, do you follow any trend lines or, or moving averages? <laughs> no, I, I don't do that. Uh, uh, no. I okay. mean, I, I think we can tell when the market's overvalued. I have no idea if we can tell when the market's going to drop or, or not. Yeah. Um, he says, also for fundamental analysis, what do you give the most importance to OPM or NPM? I, I don't know what, I mean, other people's money. I don't know what he's talking about. I do not know. Okay. No. Uh, thoughts on reverse DCF. And the book expectations investing i don't think i've read expectations investing have i i think you i no i don't think you have i think you know you're familiar with it okay i'm from let's see i was in but um i've heard of it before yeah it's oh no i have no i have i have read this one yeah so um yeah uh, I th- actually think that the approach that he takes generally, I've read a couple of different, what, whatever, you know, he's put things together in different books and, and had papers. So I, I've read a lot of what he's written and I'm sure I've read that book. I just didn't remember the title. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that his approach is usually good and that a reverse DCF type approach, if we're talking about trying to figure out what the business needs to do, the st- or the stock needs to do, I should say, to accomplish the kind of return you want is is the right approach. And that's how I usually look at things. So uh, when I'm buying a stock or something, I'm saying how, um, how poor can organic growth be and things like that. And yet um, I still get a 10% or better return or something. So um, when I say stocks really cheap, sometimes what I mean is things like I talked about one stock where I said, well, they're paying a dividend now, but imagine they don't pay a dividend for 10 years. Imagine they're the highest P multiple they ever get is 10 in the next 10 years. And imagine they grow at the rate of inflation. And if all those things are true and you still get a better than 10% return, then the stock's really cheap, you know? And so that's the reverse of doing a DCF. Uh, yeah. And I, I guess if I could add on to that, I like doing reverse DCFs. Um, just to, I mean, right. If you think about like this quote unquote variant perception, what's the market currently pricing in? 
I think it's good to know, I guess, what the stock price is, um, you know, what it's, it's saying about the company or about its future. I don't think that's bad information to know at all, especially if you're thinking about handicapping the stock. Um, how long do you take to analyze a company in depth? Uh, I would say usually my analyzing company takes maybe about one to two days or something. However, I usually don't buy it for closer to three months. Um, it has happened before that I've read things over one weekend or something and decide to buy a stock. Um, in some ways that usually ends up being like a really big position because the thing is, um, if you read the book, like fortunes formula or something where it talks about edge, you know, and the Kelly formula and stuff, it, it tends to be, it's been rare that I found that there's a situation with a really big edge, uh, where you take a long time to recognize that. So actually you'd be surprised that the, um, investments that tend to be bigger for me and that tend to work out better actually involve the shortest period of analysis, I guess. But usually I just become obsessed about that stock or whatever for a period of a couple of days. And that's most of the research. Sometimes there's other stuff that I write down like that I need to find out and stuff. So even for things like you know, positions in the fund, we don't own any positions in the fund where we didn't talk to uh, management in some way or visit sites and things. But is that part of the analysis that I did? Like that's this, you know, that takes time and is a separate thing. But in terms of like, if you're talking about the publicly available sources, I'd say it's usually less than 48 hours, but I'm not really doing anything else except for thinking about that company during that time period. Um, why is Jeff so sure that NACA will lose Great River Energy as a customer? I understand they're considering whether it's profitable to use coal as fuel for their power plants, but they didn't say it that directly in their latest 10K. Yeah, no, I'm not sure at all. I just assume that it's a total loss uh, because that's how I do calculations on things. I, you know, uh, we're not going to be short NACA. We're only going to own it. We own it. So we have to make a decision. Would we buy more of it? Would we sell what we own? Things like that. And so the best way to do that is the most conservative approach to me, which is imagine they lose this business and imagine it happens instantly. Obviously, there would probably be some period where they have to transition off of it. There's also a tiny bit of money that they might get from them. It depends on how the structure of the agreement is. I think it's almost meaningless, but there, I, my understanding is from reading how it's set up that there might be a tiny bit of money that they'd be due them. And they'd also pay them to shut down the mine and stuff. I mean, I could get paid to shut down the mine. But uh, I just assume worst case and then move on from there. Yeah. And is he still excited about the stock if they lose them? So the customer. I think that if they lose uh, that, so if the um, uh, mine there ends up being worthless, basically, if you take the value of that mine out, the value of the cash they've built up in the last, since the spinoff, plus the added value of certain other things that they've gotten, like uh, north uh, in terms of mining uh, lime rock and things like that, basically offset. So I would say that I would appraise the company at about the same value after they've lost that customer as I praise them at the time of the spinoff. So what they've lost basically is time, if you think of it. What they've built up over the last uh, you know, several years uh, makes up for the loss of that customer. But um, it is a big loss. It's just that they have piled up a lot of cash. I think as of last balance sheet, they had like $14 per share in cash or something. So they also have a totally new Lime Rock business that they really didn't have even uh, you know, four years ago or something. So it, it kind of offsets. But so if I liked it a lot when it spun off, then you can assume I like a lot still now, as long as the price is at or below the spinoff price. Got it. Um, thoughts on construction industry, specifically fire safety and plant, ma plant maintenance in this environment. Jeff looked at Babcock and Wilcox plant maintenance before. Does he like the primary business, appropriate debt level to provide adequate returns, but also safety? Um, well, I actually... So Babcock and Wilcox has two parts to it when I analyzed it and it broke up into BWX Technologies and um, BWX uh, Enterprises or, or, or B&W Enterprises. Um, that part, which is like coal maintenance and stuff, I actually liked fine, but the company went off into doing um, uh, like uh, waste to energy plants and more whatever you would call green things and stuff like that, which for an engineering company is kind of like a, an insurer going into a totally new field. I, I kind of have to sell the insurer when they do that. Probably I kind of have to sh sell an engineering firm when it goes into something it had been doing one line of business for half a century or, or more, and then it goes into a totally different one. So uh, if it's a, the right kind of engineering firm, I'd be interested. Um, yeah. And I plant maintenance, I think can be a very good business. Although that's, very specific to the fact that they have expertise in boilers. So you have to be careful. 
Uh, generally, if someone, all, you know, none of this is off the shelf stuff. So if someone built your boiler for you at a coal power plant or at a nuclear power plant or in a, a nuclear submarine or whatever, then you're going to use a firm that had that, that built that boiler for you. And the boiler tends to be one of the most important parts of your plant. And so the maintenance on that is going to continue and the life is going to be long. It could be 30 years or more. So if it's doing something that important and that customized to your situation, then yeah, I like engineering firms. Got it. Um, thoughts on DFS, OMAB. So that's what Discover Financial Services. Is Discover. that? And then yeah. that's an air part. Do you want to go through these or do you have any uh, at, at home? What? That's a retail. Uh huh. That's world acceptance and that's credit acceptance, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, world acceptance and credit acceptance are good businesses in the right time, but I've always felt that they, um, Although they're pretty good operators in that space, I don't know about world acceptance compared to how it was when I looked at it, you know, years ago. Um, I, I they have some serious risks. Um, Just so, in this environment. Yeah, so they have some serious risks. Credit acceptance is a little complicated too because of the way that they account for things and stuff. I don't blame them uh, or their management or something. I don't have a problem with them. I think that they incentivize people in the right sorts of ways and they do the best they can on a lot of stuff. Um, however, I think that some of their shareholders and people who are really excited about the stock in this bull market didn't always look carefully at um, what the earnings were like and what they'd be over a full cycle in terms of how bad it can get. I think management's realistic about it, but I definitely know from some investors who owned it that I felt they were um, a little too optimistic about that. Be careful about those because all of them have been the result of the really low um, uh interest rates um, with like discover and world acceptance and stuff. Those are unsecured loans. I'd be super careful about unsecured loans. Um, I just think that I'd rather my loans be secured by a car or something that people really are going to want to drive around in uh, than big credit card stuff. I mean, credit cards are very weird. Unsecured loans are very weird. It's incredibly hard for the company to actually ever collect those debts from you. So mm -hmm. the reason you that credit card companies work is because their customers choose to pay the credit cards. If they stop choosing to pay the credit cards, you won't um, get paid off. Yeah, and I actually tweeted this out uh, yesterday, I believe, or maybe Saturday, that millions of, it was in the Wall Street Journal, millions of Americans are skipping their credit card payments as the coronavirus pandemic puts them out of work. Um, yeah, and the other complicating factor- it makes sense. I mean, that's not like it's some, you know, crazy news. I mean, if they're going to, what are they going to stop paying first? Their, their roof over their head or their credit card balance, you know? Yeah, the other thing that's happening, I think, is this is the area where you're seeing credit be pulled back. So home equity loans and, uh, well, three things really. I think lines of credit to corporations are quietly being, I won't say pulled, but the bankers are going to the corporations and saying, can you not actually pull the, can you not actually draw the whole line? Um, we know that we promised you that it'll be here, but come on, we can work this out in some way where you don't do this. Um, and then uh, I think credit cards, uh, people, uh, the lenders are pulling down the credit limits on that and stuff without warning their customers are going to do that. So a lot of credit you thought you had goes away. And then home equity loans too. People thought they could get home equity loans. They're not going to be able to now. People thought they could get, um, they, if they were told their credit card has a limit of 10000 it could suddenly be 5000 and then um, and then other things like that. So I think that there's been more contraction of credit. The concept of credit, technically, that isn't counted as it because those are off balance sheet things that people were expecting. There were commitments that they were expecting they could get. Um, but that's kind of what happens in situations like this. Actually, uh, Jim Grant wrote a good book called Money of the Mind, where he says credit is money of the mind. The fact that you think you can, you know, spend up to ten thousand dollars on a credit card when you only uh, are counting a balance of a thousand or whatever, that other nine thousand is what you, you know, it's a credit that you think exists, but then it can disappear in a situation like this. And that's what's happening in those cases. So I'd be very cautious about unsecured lenders. Uh, I'd be more interested in like, you know, ones that are uh, lending with cars and stuff. So credit acceptance is a little different than world acceptance. Got it. Why do certain franchisers such as Domino's and Wingstop have small percentage of uh, PPE to sales, whereas McDonald's has a very high percentage of PPE to sales, which has a better business model. Um, I don't know all the details of that, why they do. I mean, Domino's, so um, hmm, I, I don't actually know the example of why McDonald's has such a high percentage. I don't know how many they have that are um, company owned stores and things like that. Um, the pizza company only do have some um, manufacturing capacity or warehousing capacity. So it's a surprise that they would be a lot lower than McDonald's. Um, but 
uh, I, which is a better business. I mean, I would, at the same price, I'd probably be a lot more interested in Domino's and Wingstop than I would be in McDonald's. Not that McDonald's is a bad business, but it's a very mature business. And um, I, I, I think Domino's and Wingstop both are very strong positions in their respective industries. Obviously, pizza is a much bigger industry than, um, uh, than chicken wings. I, I only frequent Wingstop. I don't frequent Domino's. Yeah, I, I know what's funny is last. So, have you been watching The Last Dance? I already know you have it, but for everybody that's been watching, do you know what The Last Dance is, Jeff? On ESPN, no. is that oh, so is it a Michael Jordan thing? Yeah, yeah. So it's Michael Jordan, and they were following you know camera crew, blah blah blah. But what's cool is is that they've uh, they've been playing like old commercials from back then. Uh-huh. So when I was watching last night, they had a a commercial and the uh, broadcaster was like, "One day you'll be able to order a pizza from your phone," and it, it made <laughs> me think about Domino's. I was like, "That's true." Yeah, Lick of a button. All right. Uh, thoughts on scale economics, shared and price Quebec model of Geico, Costco, and Amazon. An example: keep margins low, grow scale, customer reciprocate, pass on cost savings, etc. Is this the ultimate moat? Uh, I don't know if it's ultimate moat. From microeconomic perspective, it's always better to give some of the gains to the customer than to keep 100 percent of it for yourself. I can't think of any situation in which it would be best to capture 100% of it for yourself. Um, I, I mean, I guess if you were some sort of monopoly where there was no price elasticity and you had 100% of the um, market, that would be okay. But it's not a realistic situation in the real world. So you always give back some. Um, I think that it, it's uh, it's a very good moat. Um, and the other advantage that Geico, Costco, and Amazon have from this is you can end up with high customer retention rates by doing this. You can also end up with a lot of data, um, which can be very useful. So... I think it works for those companies in their specific areas. I have to say, though, that like overall in studies that have been done of all industries and stuff, pricing power, the ability to charge more for a product that is uh, allegedly the same, um, seems to be more associated with higher returns than lower cost ones. Um, the lower cost ones seem to work well for a while. However, um, we do have some examples where someone else who has a lower cost than you comes in and it really devastates you. So... If for these mega companies where they own like a huge, where your market is gigantic, which is what Amazon, Costco, and Geico all compete in, they're giant markets. It probably makes a lot of sense. For more niche markets, I don't think that a low cost model makes as much sense. Got it. Any interesting Scandinavian stocks on your radar? We do look at some Scandinavian stocks. Um, uh, you know, I, I think Andrew mentioned one time that we tasted some uh, cider in a hotel and stuff, and that was because of a, uh, a, a Swedish stock. Um, that we were sampling their product. Uh, there are just a sample. Been, you're right. Just a sample. <laughs> not 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 both cases. You're correct. <laughs> um, there's also um, uh, there, there is a a write up on the website, Focus Compounding website, about uh, a insurer. There, I've looked at a bank. Um, we have looked at a couple Norwegian stocks. We were invested in one stock in Norway at one time. We are no longer. And there's one or two there that I'm somewhat interested in. As a market, it's someplace that interests me a lot and I've gotten more interested recently because the prices of certain Nordic stock, uh, Nordic um, currencies versus the U.S. currency have for the first time in a while made it more realistic for me to take U.S. dollars, tr- trade them over into the local currency and buy a stock and be okay with it without hedging. Historically, I felt that their currencies were a bit overvalued. <laughs> like take an example like Norway. Norway is a major oil producer, so you can understand why its price would, uh, its currency would go down and U.S. currency would go up. But like historically, without hedging, I wouldn't have felt comfortable in, in several of those countries, not all, but in two of those countries. Got it. Would you rather buy FRT or LAMR? So that's Lamar. And then what's FRT? Uh, it's Fed Realty Investment Trust. I don't think I know that one. Uh, so is, what's Lamar? Is that uh, billboards? Yeah. Federal Realty Investment Trust. I'm not the world's biggest fan of real estate investment trusts. If that's what this is. So um, people know that and don't like <laughs> that I said that before. Uh, I should point out the industry has done fine for the last 40 years. It's got, uh, it has know, increased its quarterly dividends to a shareholder for 52 consecutive years, the longest record in the REIT industry. Yeah, that's what I was going to point out. The thing that I was always about the REIT industry is if you look, they start measuring from like the 1970s. Uh, REITs were created about... 15 years or so before that and had some 
big issues. So it's interesting when they started measuring uh, how they did. I think but, it's interesting uh, that they put that in the business description. I mean, he's just pulling this from sec.gov. So that's like in their 10K business yeah. description. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know this company. I'd be interested in looking at it. Um, oftentimes, REITs have perfectly good assets. It's just the structure of them that, that makes me a little cautious and stuff. Let's see if I can see anything here. You're not logged in, right? I am. Oh, okay. Can you go to the income statement then just so I can see something? Um, yeah, this is the one thing that worries me about REITs is if you look at the bottom one there, the shares diluted, it always bothers me because if you look, they're increasing their number of shares over time while paying you out a dividend. So how much of the dividend is really, in fact, go to the cash flow statement and we can show you this. Um, how much of the dividend is really any sort of earned dividend as opposed to being issued back out there. So if you look cash paid for dividends is that number there, issuance of common stock is that number up there. You only count the difference and it's okay. They have paid more in dividends in most years that I can see than they've issued in stock. I definitely would want that. Absent yeah. that, it is effectively a Ponzi scheme in that they're <laughs> issuing, well, it is because they're issuing stock and then they're using the stock, the proceeds from the stock issuance to pay dividends to people. So you always want to make sure that the cash paid for dividends exceeds the um, net issuance of common stock. If it doesn't, then what they're doing is they're taking from new investors to pay out to old investors, which is the definition of a Ponzi scheme. That's my clickbait for this. <laughs> Thank you very much. So no thoughts. So this on. one's fine. No, this is fine. They're not doing that. They're, I mean, they are issuing stock and, and they're paying out dividends. But that's the first thing I would look for with a REIT is how much stock have they been issuing over time relative to dividends. I love it. I'm converting you over to the dark side. Good job. Um, thoughts on PCHM? Uh, it's a sweat patch drug testing company. Dark stock oh. in the woods has grown revenue yeah. annually and net income 40% annually since 2015. Do uh, dividend was double in 2019 as cash was piling up on the balance sheet. EV to EBIT is 3.8 times. Financials are on their website. Yes, I've read, there are financials on their website. I've read it. I've, I've put together all the past ones that I could on that company and put it into like an Excel sheet and stuff. I didn't feel there was enough information for me to understand them well enough and to understand the technology well enough and get comfortable with it. Um, you know, if you could find 10 stocks like that, just in terms of how cheap they were and, and still are cheap and buy them, you know, it should work out. I don't think the information is out there and available to get me comfortable with the business, but when a stock is that cheap, you know, I don't know who said it, if it was uh Pabri or who it was saying, you know, thou shall not, um, you know, pass on stocks that trade at two PE or one PE or whatever. Yeah, 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 and, and, yeah. And this stock at one point probably did trade at something like that, especially when you factor in cash <laughs> and stuff. Um, I have written up on the website Psychomedics, and I feel there's more information about Psychomedics and hair tests in general than Sweat. I, I'm not as convinced that Sweat is a as effective product and stuff, but you know this the the company is incredibly cheap. So, got it. Um, outside of the positive scenario where they track where they track back to net current asset value or beyond, when does it become time to sell out of a net net? So we actually <laughs> we went over that. That's good. You want to hit on that? Yeah. So Graham said after two years, he could just sell them. That's, I would say um, for me, either the only example, the only thing where I would kind of say it's okay to sell to people, if you want to think about this is if you can calculate the Z score, a Z score is a certain risk of bankruptcy uh, above three. It's supposed to be not at, at risk of bankruptcy and below 1.81. It's supposed to be a risk of bankruptcy and between 1.8 and three, it's supposed to be um, indeterminate. So if you use that, which wasn't designed exactly for net nets and things like that, and it keeps saying that it's above a three in terms of Z-score, I would wait until it gets to NCAV. I, I, I really would. I don't see any reason to sell a stock, no matter how long it's languishing, if it has, if it, the reading is saying that there's no bankruptcy risk and you're not yet at net current asset value, because literally then you're selling something below liquidation value. Um, that's just me. Some people say sell after two years. If that makes you feel better to sell after two years or something, that that's fine with me. But I, I don't kind of believe in strategies that say sell after a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. So, But studies say that's fine. Studies say like buy it, hold it for a year and then sell it. Thoughts on Novatech? Look it up in QuickFS. You'll be surprised. Okay. Let's look it up. Um, it's over-the-counter stock. Okay. Um, minerals extraction. PE seven times, EV, EV to free cash flow, 28.5. EV to sales, uh, 4.3. 10-year media margins on EBIT, 35.3. I guess kind of in the wheelhouse. 10-year Kager on revenue, everything looks you know incredible, even free cash flow. What There's no product, description. Right. Do we know what product they're outputting? So it, it looks interesting. Look at those returns on capital and stuff. It looks very interesting. 
Um, but what product are they outputting? Can we just type in Novatech into uh, into Google or something? Uh, the Russian gas market. Ah. Uh, uh, okay. Um, I, I don't think I would invest in a company whose assets are in Russia. Why is that, Jeff? Uh, I actually was encouraged to invest in a company in Russia a couple times. Uh, and... Uh, not a company in Russia. In both cases, there's a company outside Russia that held assets in Russia. And I just, people explained why it wouldn't um, uh, have political involvement in and stuff. And I, I passed and actually they ended up having political involvement. In that. So, <laughs> so I don't know. I just, Russia isn't in a place I'm very comfortable with. Uh, it, it would be take a lot to get me to invest in a company in Russia or China. There are some other countries too, but those two would be two, some of the toughest. Yeah, I figured. Uh, thoughts on BFFBF and the waste management industry in general? I, I like the waste management uh, business in general. Um, I don't know if I know that. Oh, Info? yeah. Oh. Yeah. So I actually was going to write up the stock for uh, this is a UK stock. It's the big it's definitely the leader in the commercial and industrial sector for um, waste management. Um, there it, it's rolled up a bunch of different companies. It's, it has great scale and stuff there. I read their annual report and stuff and I don't know, I just wasn't that impressed with how well they described the business and that I felt I had a real understanding of them as opposed to the industry. So I could buy them on the basis of the industry and, um, and get comfortable with it that way. But I was kind of just assuming that they were running things in a way that would be similar to how I expect the industry to work in the United States. They have some debt and stuff. Um, so I just didn't get comfortable with it from that perspective and chose not to write it up. It was actually on a list of stocks that I was going to write up. I read all sorts of things about it. And I just, for whatever reason, don't feel like there's enough information out about the company, its strategy, and um, company-specific things about it as opposed to industries things. And so I just backed away from writing about it. Um, I, you know, it may work out perfectly well, but I got like no feel for management and their, their capital allocation plans or any of that from reading it. I just, maybe I didn't do a good job reading the annual report or what, but uh, I read the annual report, the presentation. I read, you know, whether it's been written up anywhere on online, I thought I was going to really like the business, but I just wasn't getting enough from the company to understand it. Um, what is the process of setting an SMA like fee structure, legal stuff, et cetera. Uh, you could hire consultants to help you out with that. Um, yeah, I'm not a lawyer, neither a chef, so maybe we shouldn't get into that. But it's it's fairly simple. You set up a, a registered investment advisor in the state that you're in. <clears throat> For us, we're in Texas. That part Excuse that me. part isn't that simple. No, it's you. I mean, look, I'm not a lawyer, and neither is Jeff. So hire somebody to do it for you. Um, you could do RIA in a box, compliance consultants. Um, there's just a bunch of different ones, but definitely hire someone to do it for you because you want to make sure you get that right. Um, does he ever invest in net nets that are biotech companies? I think I have not invested in net nets that are biotech companies, but I can't swear to that because it's possible that I invested in a net net that was a biotech company that became a cash shell where other people came in who were not the original biotech people. So I have invested in companies like that. I mean, some things I don't even think of as net nets because I think of them as like workouts. So I have invested in companies in which I expected the net operating losses um, uh, to be uh, an asset that would be used in some way, or I expected like a short form merger, which is a way in which someone would kind of get the cash if they were almost controlled the whole company out of it um, and into, in, into another entity of theirs, things like that. So uh, yeah, when they trade below cash and they're not really involved in biotech anymore, I may buy them, but no, uh, as long as I think there's real biotech people still in, involved in running them and they think of themselves as biotech companies, I wouldn't touch them. Got it. Um, uh, if you'd exclusively focus on investing in private SME businesses, how would your investment approach and criteria differ from that of public equities? What does SME mean? Uh, I don't know. All right. Me neither. Let's go. Um, here, I actually, I just want to, I, I liked something earlier cause I actually wanted to get your opinion on it. Um, so this is my Q and a for you, Jeff. So, um, for Texas reopening. Yeah. It says, uh, so retail stores, restaurants, movie theaters, malls can reopen, but at no more than 25% occupancy. I mean, mm -hmm. isn't that going to kill businesses? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think movie theaters won't open. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but I mean, Cinemark is headquartered here and they that previously said that they don't need their employees back till the middle of July. They bring them back in June to start retraining them for the 
the locations and they probably black out at least every other seat. Um, so that'd be 50% occupancy. Um, I, you know, I don't know. 50, 25% occupancy though, isn't necessarily anywhere near, um, uh, I mean, restaurants, yeah, 25% occupancy isn't acceptable. Uh, some of the other ones, who knows? I don't know. 25% occupancy for a mall. I'm not sure what occupancy is defined at in a mall. So, but yeah, 25% occupancy for restaurants is probably not okay. I don't know what to make of that because if they mean what's on the, what the state determines is the occupancy limit, then that could be okay for some people. Um, you know, the number the limit to the number of people who can be in the, uh, location at the same time, you know, that that's a publicly decided thing. Um, so if that's true, then some of them could be okay. I, I mean, malls could recover a lot. I would assume at 25% occupancy. Mm -hmm. Um, cool. Um, yeah, I thought that was interesting. So here's some questions that people have emailed in. I took out their names. I think I took out everyone's names. And then we have YouTube ones that I scrubbed as well. Uh, it says, hi, Andrew. Jeff has repeatedly mentioned several high yield bonds became attractive in recent downturn as focused compounding capital is not invest in high yield bonds Would Jeff discuss which issuers and bonds became interesting and why he found them. So, um, so first of all, I actually found preferred stock more interesting than high yield. Um, but I, yes. So high yield that wasn't related to some energy things and stuff I thought was uh, potentially interesting. I, I did say, although it's much too distressed and stuff for me to suggest to people on the podcast that they should have been involved in or something, uh, that, you know, um, 12% for, uh, carnival was pretty attractive considering their asset position, um, that, that their asset position was really strong. So, you know, um, energy, no, I, I didn't find that interesting, but some of those. So basically if you're talking about the ones that were directly affected by coronavirus in a serious way while having really strong balance sheets, those did look interesting, but even in cases like carnival and stuff, the problem is that. I felt that usually, and this is why some preferred stock kind of caught my eye. Um, I, I didn't feel that the bonds went that far without the possibility of them being called, which is a lot less attractive. Um, so it, I wasn't seeing things with really long-term bonds that weren't able to be called. Whereas there were a couple preferred stock issues that I thought were much, much safer than bonds and yet couldn't be called for over five years um, that, that traded up to it, uh, traded down to pretty exciting yields. The same exact thing happened. In fact, in one case, it happened in the exact same company in uh, like 2008. And I think it probably has a lot to do with who holds the preferred stock. I don't think that's held largely by individuals. So I think the people dumping the preferred stock need to get out of it. I need to get liquid. And so that was a brief time, but like a, it was a week or two that I thought was very attractive. So actually it was preferred stock more than um, high yield that I found attractive. Got it. Um, hi, George and Andrew. Okay. Firstly, a quick thank you for your podcast. But okay. Thank you for watching. In one episode, you discussed Sydney Airport and mentioned you would look at others. Have you looked at, uh, he's talking about all the Mexican airports. They look very interesting. So we actually did a podcast recently where we talked about a little bit about airports. But do you have any thoughts on Mexican airports in general? No, I don't. I have looked at some airports, in, mainly in Europe. And, uh, and like you said, uh, Sydney airport, I find most of them expensive to be honest. So, um, they were pretty expensive before this started. So it just, uh, you know, infrastructure in general, I just find extremely expensive and probably has something to do with the fact that you can borrow money at nothing in a lot of these currencies. But, um, yeah, so I, I like airports as a business a lot. I just have not found them to be cheap. Got it. He could be talking about, um, the chief comfort officer. Yeah. That, so you should take, so he should have taken that question. Yeah. The puppy George. All right. Um, I'm not sure there's my email. Uh, let's see. Okay. He has a question about banks. This is the right email. So info at focus okay. .com is a good place to email in questions if you want uh, to get them on the show. It says, I think the Fed is going to keep interest rates low for a very long time. We won't see uh, reversion to the mean. If you assume I'm right about that, how does it affect your evaluation of banks? How will they remain profitable in a zero or negative real and nominal rate environment? Uh, it's very bad for banks generally. Some banks work a little differently. And so it, there'd be higher differentiation between the banks, which ones are good and which aren't. Um, it would be very damaging to banks like Frost, stuff like that, where I think that historically a lot of their advantages are from having lower rates. In general, it would cause all banks to eh, potentially cause all banks to earn more 
commodified type returns. It wouldn't matter as much which banks were good and which weren't good. And um, it would be very harmful to them in terms of their returns on equity and stuff. If they tried to keep paying the same amount of dividends, they would slow down, not be able to grow that much. I think credit would expand less quickly. And I think it would cause all sorts of problems that way. So I don't even know if it's a desirable outcome for the Fed in the long run to have that happen. Um, but it also depends on the steepness of the yield curve. Because if low, if um, short-term rates are very, very low, but long-term rates are much higher, then that would work better for banks in many ways. So um, it, it would distort things for banks in a lot of ways that would be uh, troubling. And it would generally make U.S. banking look more like European banking, which in general is a less profitable business. But, you know, Japan has had that for a long time. And to some extent, Europe has had that. So and I don't like their banks as much as U.S. banks. And part of it has to do with um, the rate situation and other things too, though. Uh, perfect. Uh, let's see. I have a question. What is your current thoughts on CSVI now and going forward? It dropped 31.5% from the high and it's trading at a 23x multiple. Yeah, I mean, that's good. Uh, it's more attractive. We did buy at a price that it's still, what, 50% by multiple higher than the price we paid. So um, I didn't keep buying more and more of it at high prices. So I, I'm generally not going to pay 23 times or something. I, I like computer services a lot. And I think that in general, banks will still have to pay about the same amount for information technology stuff, for all this stuff, regardless of how good their um, own results are. So I think they may grow faster than their customers continue to do that if their customers have trouble. I think it's a really good business. Uh, I think it's better than a lot of businesses trading at 20 or 25 times PE, um, but I still don't like to pay that kind of price. Let's see. We've been getting this actually a lot. What does Jeff think about Beglari Holdings, its strategy management and its investment style and its crazy founder? Yeah. So this is a hard one because I don't like to talk about this company publicly and stuff. I've actually researched it a lot. I've researched it a lot and thought about it a lot. Um, it mainly because it consists of a bunch of different parts that you can value. And I'm not sure that the investors in it, whether the people who like it a lot or the people who hate it, um, are all that rational about it. And it's interesting. Uh, the, some of the decisions that they've made and stuff are pretty good. Um, and it's done a lot of, I would say, pretty smart things on that. On the other hand, there's lots of things about the uh, controlling shareholder uh, that, from a personality perspective, uh, would generally be not someone that you'd want to invest a lot with. Um, however, I think that usually uh, discussions of the company don't give enough credit to the smart things that they've done, including some very smart things that they've done in insurance stuff. Um, they've had excellent investments, usually excellent investments in restaurant stuff. He usually knows how to do restaurants very well. Um, it's has some starting to have some real major positions in insurance stuff. And in general, it's not hard for me. They've basically sold off their Cracker Barrel position, but it wouldn't be hard for me to analyze Cracker Barrel, to analyze Steak and Shake, which is their restaurant business, and to analyze their insurance businesses. Now, they have bought a little bit of other stuff. They own Maxim. And they own uh, an oil-related uh, company that they bought recently. But generally, it consists of parts that are fairly easy for me to value. And it seems to um, trade at prices that don't necessarily reflect economic analysis of things. Instead, people are just obsessed with the founder. So it's an opportunity for people to look and analyze the company, and uh, as opposed to maybe just getting all worked up about how they, if they feel like they're being um, ripped off or whatever by someone running it, like if they do a hedge fund. I was going to say, what are your thoughts on the fees and the way that they apply that to the company? Same thing as a closed end fund or anything like that. If your discount's big enough and or, and or their uh, returns above uh, comparable sorts of um, investments works out, then you're fine. Um, I, you know, uh, closed end funds, mutual funds, things like that take fees. Uh, just because they have, if a closed-end fund had a fee of 4% or something, there'd be some price, some discount at which I'd be willing to buy it. Um, Big Lari's at times traded incredibly cheaply compared to other sorts of structures of things. So um, I don't know. I mean, you have to do the breakup value and think about the sum of the parts. What would this restaurant be worth? What would these insurance companies be worth and stuff separately? It has definitely had applied to it a closed-end fund type um, uh, discount. And uh, I run a fund in which I charge fees on it. I mean, I guess his fees are technically higher, but, um, you know, <laughs> but, but I mean, the fees are what they are. People invest in all sorts of funds and do fine with high fees. Um, you know, people invest in Buffett with Buffett and he had high fees that, you know, 
end up being several percent of, uh, you know, being very, when you factored in what they actually turned out to be, they were higher than what anyone would consider an acceptable fee, but he left investors off much better that way. So uh, I think it's an interesting company. I think if you're going to buy it and stuff, don't tell anyone you're going to buy it. Sure. Um, just be quiet about it. But I think that the it's very emotional for people and stuff. And I don't think that the price generally reflects any sort of rational thought about the business. Got it. Um, okay. So we got another one on that. Oh, here's a good one. Your thoughts on air. <laughs> Why do you guess when you see that come up? <laughs> air cap holding. <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of thoughts on air, air cap. I mean, yes, we can go into quick cap and then go to the business description. There you go. Yes, you do. What's your thought? Okay. All right. So you can read some of the business descriptions so we understand this. It's an aircraft leasing company engages in leasing, financing, sale, and management of commercial aircraft and engines okay. in China, the United States, Ireland, and internationally. All right. So what I pointed out before is just my feeling, which is very different from everyone else's feeling is I don't think the collateral is going to be in anything other than a very oversupply condition for a very long time. I could be wrong. Uh, it's very possible because I don't focus on airline industry or something like that. But, you know, it, one of the things for the problem is like when they're with coronavirus and stuff is people talking about how are we going to stimulate these things? How are we going to save Boeing and Airbus and stuff? I don't know how you save Boeing and Airbus unless you get rid of some of the planes that already exist right now. We've had oil prices drop by a tremendous amount. That generally will reduce the price of jet fuel. Uh, if jet fuel is not that expensive, the same way that like bunker fuel isn't that expensive for cruise lines, there's little need to buy new um, planes, buy new ships, all that stuff, and focus on designs that are more efficient in terms of fuel usage, because uh, it's not something that you want to save on by having a high capital cost up front. So that extends the useful life of the planes that you have generally. If you're carrying more debt, as I think airlines will be, they're less likely to buy more planes. If you have if you're only using part of your capacity that you have now, there's not a lot of need to buy new planes. So I think you have planes last for longer. I think there's a danger that used plane um, prices get into a situation that you don't want to face, uh, just as that can happen with lots of other things. So I think it's potentially a situation that's similar to what happened to home builders and stuff after 2008. So that's what I worry about, especially because with airlines, it was one of these, with air travel, it was one of these areas that people were so convinced grew at whatever 5% globally or whatever year after year. And so that means everyone's already leaning forward with this idea of where they need to be in a year or two. And so you just end up with too much supply when it suddenly reverses into a situation where you thought you were going to need to be at 110% of what you had in 2019 and 2021 or whatever. And actually you need to be at 70% or something, you know, you have this huge gap. So I don't know enough about air caps specifically, but what I am saying is that when I look out and think about what kind of collateral would I be most, what kind of assets would I be most worried about owning, that they'd be most oversupplied, the asset I just would worry is and tremendously oversupplied is airplanes. Because that's why we talked about like with restaurants. The nice thing about restaurants, I mean, it's bad for the people running them, but it's good for the survivors, is take New York City. New York City has huge amounts of restaurants run by individual people and families and stuff. They won't survive. Those businesses won't open back up. So you will have taken out a lot of the capacity. And so then even if you can't get back to the same exact level of people eating out, but eventually you will, then you can have a really strong recovery. But in something like airplanes, commercial jets, I'm very worried about there being too many of them in the world for too long. So that would just be like from a, what do you want to call it, a macro perspective or whatever, that would worry me about a company like this. Um, but it doesn't mean that this company isn't you know, a great operator and that it doesn't have um, the right balance sheet or whatever because I haven't analyzed it. But I just mean from my perspective, the thing that I'm most worried about is long-term oversupply in the industry, which always worries me. And these are slow assets. The, this is what worries me too. And then I've written about with other companies and stuff is there's a reason why like net nets are more attractive than companies that are heavy in assets like, um, you know, say commercial property um, owners and stuff like that, they think they can borrow and stuff against it, but we don't know about that in the future. So it's not the same as having cash from it. Um, uh, so it's not the same as having like inventory and receivables. So sometimes people look at the price to book and stuff and say, that's very exciting, the price to book there. But the price to book on a company like this is not like the price to book on an insurer or a bank, um, obviously. So the, those are you know liquid assets that are very uh, quickly turning into cash. So that would be my caution is that this asset that they have is something that I happen to be a bit worried about.
out. So for me, this is not really the right company to buy. But if you feel differently about the asset, then maybe this is something to look at. Got it. Good answer. Um, let's see. It's regarding net nets. Jeff mentioned he does a little research on the business and almost only worries about fraud. What does he check about net net in terms of business quality and how does he check for fraud? Um, I happen to have a net net check checklist in front of me and it runs for five pages, I think. Um, so some of the things that I look at are retained earnings, liabilities, what forms there are, uh, all sorts of things like that cash, receivables, inventory, property planning, equipment, customer suppliers, labor, are they unionized, things like that. What legal fees are they, uh, what legal risks do they face? Management, CEO, chairman, CFO, how much they own of everything, how old they are, how long they've been with the company, how they're compensated, things like that. Um, audit, who's the auditor, Where the, where's the auditor from, how long have they been auditing the company? I pulled the PCAOB report, um, things like that. So it, it depends on the specific company, but it's just like checking how safe each of the things are. The, the most important thing, of course, is an absence of liabilities. I would say that in general, uh, very low liabilities and very high retained earnings. Um, in terms of the business quality and stuff like that, um, it's just a question of whether the business is solid, not really whether it's a very good business. Uh, and that net, even if it just returns, you know, 8% or whatever returns on capital at some point, will probably become a good stock for you, especially if it's cyclical, because people will buy it on the earnings. The thing with net nets is you buy them on the assets and then you sell them on earnings. That's basically how it works out and how you make your good return. So, you know, a cyclical company that I might not love or something uh, would actually be fine as a net net. Uh, basically, I want to be around for a long time, reasonably honest and competent people running it, stuff like that. It's not a question of how good the business is. It's just a question of how this can go terribly badly. It's more like if I was lending the company money, I really just focus 100% on the downside and not the upside. I pretend I have no upside in the business. If I figure out that there's really little likelihood that I can lose a lot of money in this, then I buy it, not really analyzing how much upside I'll get. I really just completely forget about upside. The fact that I'm buying at such a cheap price will be my upside. So I look at it just like a lender might look at it or something like that. You, you know, Just really like an insurance risk or a lending risk or something, thinking, well, how can this go bad and how bad can it go? How much do I have to pay out? Uh, you know, how much will I lose of my total I'm putting in stuff like that. So it's totally different than how I analyze business in which I hope you have upside that compounds over time. Is that because you're buying like a basket of the companies? Nope. It's because of the incredibly low price. What so, about I, fraud? Everyone asks about fraud. Uh, I don't have an answer for it. I don't, I don't really know. To me, usually it looks obvious what kinds of things would set off risks of fraud. I mean, so for example, if a company has tremendously high retained earnings, is it likely to be a fraud? No. If it has tremendously high retained earnings compared to, say, its total asset, its total, its total balance sheet, and compared to its market cap, what kind of fraud would work like that? That's generally not a very good way of doing a fraud. Um, however, if it's issued a lot of stock over time and stuff, could be a fraud. How is management being paid? Does management have a lot of stock in the company? Do they get options and stuff? Is it a stock you could manipulate in some way? If you can't, then all those things are, you know, less likely to be a fraud. Is it listed in the same company that it's uh, the same country that it's in originally? Um, it, has it ever bothered to incorporate someplace that would be more advantageous for management? So, for instance, let's say you're looking at a company headquartered in Texas. If I see it's a company headquartered in Texas and it's incorporated in Texas, well, if I'm going to run a fraud, that's a stupid way of doing it because I should incorporate in Nevada or I should at least incorporate in Delaware. I shouldn't stay in the state in which I am because I'm missing out on certain protections that I would have. The fact I never did that probably means I'm not that worried about outside shareholders doing stuff. I'm not thinking that hard with my lawyers about how exactly to play these things out. So I'm best positioned and structurally with this company. And I'm not thinking about fraud stuff. Um, I get worried in countries around the world where they list offshore or something, you know? So in situations in which let's say you're a UK company or whatever, but you list on uh, but you uh, incorporate or something on Channel Islands, and you could be doing that for tax avoidance reasons. But still, I, I, I that would worry me more. The same thing if we have something listed in the let's say it's a Chinese company listed in the US and it's actually through a structure in the Cayman Islands. Well, that would worry me more too. Um, if it's something that's set up to like encourage certain kinds of things that might get people excited. Uh, I would worry about that. So let's say that we say the company uh, buys and uh, we, we buy, refurbish and sell steel in different ways or something. Unlikely to be a, a fraud because who would think of that as a way of doing a fraud? No one would because it's not going to attract any 
people to scam. But as like a confidence uh, game sort of thing, if you said we do something with solar panels, uh, we do something with cannabis, um, you know, we do something that plays into those mega trends of society and stuff uh, that people think are happening in different places and whatever, then that's much more likely to be a fraud. If it's, you know, any of those things. In general, the simplest question to ask is always, uh, you have to, from the, the, the thing is, I don't want to blame people for falling for lies, but you can't be lied to or a lie can't matter unless you agree to that lie. So you're coming in and you're in a way saying, okay, this is what I want to hear. And then you're, it, when they give you what you want to hear, you're accepting that as if it's truth. And that is how you get taken in by fraud. It's how you get taken in by any sort of lie. Okay, so, so what, lies, what does that mean? I don't get that. Well, what it means is if you come in and try to forget what your interests are in this situation, it's very hard for people, for, it's impossible for a lie to harm you. You're, you're, you're going to be harmed by a lie because you believe it, what you want to believe, okay? So if you come into it looking for the things you want to believe, and that's the big mistake that a lot of investors make, right? We, a lot of people do that because they're thinking about the upside or whatever. They want to find the next compounder. So when the company tells you we're the next compounder, you believe it, even though their financial statements say that's not true. So instead, you want to focus in on stuff like, the most important thing to focus in on is, what are they telling me that isn't in their interest, right? Or what are they telling me that I don't want to hear necessarily? Focus in on that stuff. Everything they tell me that I want to hear is stuff that you should push off to one side and really question whether that's important or not. And that's true for like this kind of stuff, but it's also true if you're talking to people in any other way. Anything someone tells you that you could guess they would want, that they could guess that you would want to hear is something you should put a very low value on the possibility that it's true and that you should rely on it, right? If you pick up immediately that someone... Uh, that someone probably wants to be told they're good looking or whatever, then when someone tells you that, it's pretty much meaningless. You should not rely on that because you probably gave off a vibe that that's what you want to hear. It's easy for people to figure that out. So don't assume that kind of thing. But if they tell you something that you're like, wow, that in no way like is the kind of thing that I would expect to pitch to investors, right? That's something you should put a lot of faith into. Um, and so usually it's looking for those sorts of things that it just in terms of candor and stuff that you can find, it's usually the stuff that like, what are they telling me that isn't the normal sales pitch for this kind of company? And the problem with frauds generally, uh, I mean, there's lots of different things about them, but, but one of them is that if you go through their investor presentations and stuff, it's almost all the stuff an investor would want to hear and nothing they wouldn't want to hear. There's other stuff that you can find in it that bothers me. Um, there's certain stuff of <sighs> shifting around logical sorts of things um, to make it sound like something is one way or another by uh, certain logical tricks that are common in things. Uh, I'll give an example from advertising. Uh, not that this is fraud, but this is the kind of trick that they pull all the time. Is So in advertising, an insurance company like Geico could run an ad saying, on average, people who switch to Geico save $200 a month. Okay, And then Progressive could run an ad that says, on average, people who uh, you know, two hundred dollars a year. On average, people who switch um, to Progressive save two hundred dollars a year. Well, realistically, if we stop to think about that for a second, those could all be people who switch from Progressive to Geico or Geico to Progressive. Why would you switch to the insurer that has the higher price? Insurers don't offer the same price for everyone. There's a percentage of of the group that will be cheaper at Progressive or cheaper at Geico. You know, always. So if those were the only two insurers in the world, they could still both run that ad because it's true. But they told you ones who switch. Not that someone who doesn't switch has that chance of getting that. It's the people who switch. It's a different population. That sort of thing shows up constantly in frauds. They say weird things like that. Like there's stuff where they say um, that we have this rate or that accepting these things. And then you think about it and you're like, well, but those are the things that cause that kind of stuff to happen all the time. You know, like, um, you know, uh, we have high retention of our employees, except for those employees that left us for, you know, jobs at other firms in the industry or something, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, like they literally can be truly bizarre stuff like that. And because of the way that people's minds work and stuff, if they just supply a reason like that and sound reasonable about it, you go, Oh yeah, that makes sense. But it makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> and there's lots of things like that that you see in companies. Um, so, you know, it, I mean, at the extreme cases, it shouldn't be that hard to tell them apart. Sometimes it's very hard to tell apart a fraud from a company that is honest, not fraudulent at all, but is extremely promotional. 
But on the extreme other side of things, a company that's doing nothing to promote its stock, nothing to you know do any of uh, that sort of stuff, it's fairly easy to tell it's not a fraud. Um, and with net nets, that's usually how it, it um, how easy it is because they're completely cheap stocks. So either some people are in on the idea this is probably a fraud, like Chinese reverse mergers. Me and lots of other people saw them as net nets and went and touched them because we felt they were likely frauds. And some other people bought them thinking that, you know, well, they, they might not be frauds or something. So it could be that. Or it could be this company is so under the radar that no one even knows about it and everyone finds it boring. Well, that is very unlikely to be a fraud because <laughs> that's not an effective way of running a fraud. Like it's not an effective way to run a fraud and not issue stock for 20 years to pay a dividend, to not pay yourself a lot in options and um, to do things like that. I mean, maybe conceivably there is a way to run that as a fraud. There are ways to like, you know, your brother-in-law owns the company that you're not disclosing that you're buying all this stuff from and whatever. But in terms of the kinds of things investors are worried about, the, the company that has no analysts covering it and that's extremely boring, has been around forever, pays dividends, doesn't issue stock, is funded entirely from retained earnings and all that sort of stuff and pays base salaries to their uh, to the CEOs who mostly just worry about not running the thing into the ground, you know, not being embarrassed by the performance they have and not ruining the lives of all their employees and people and stuff like that. That is really unlikely to be a fraud. And net nets usually present things that are that easy to tell. Now, there are other companies that aren't net nets that I think it's harder to tell. And at some points, even with frauds and things, I can tell they weren't a fraud to start with, but did they start doing fraudulent stuff later on and whatever? Even if for things we know are frauds, like you start talking to me about what happened with Tyco or something, I don't know at what point Tyco became what kind of fraud and stuff. I, I don't know how that all happened and when the shifts happened. Um, but it's not usually as hard as figuring out things like that in net nets. It's usually much simpler. It's things that are like totally made up, like Chinese reverse mergers. There was never a business. I mean, the business was, it, to the extent there was a business, it was never even one one thousand the size of what they said it was. And the most boring companies imaginable you could find, which act as if they're privately owned and don't even have any awareness that they have a stock and don't try to get their story out to investors. That second group is the one that isn't frauds. Got it. So it's really use common sense. That's what I think, but I do get tons of emails from people about frauds that like they want a simpler sort of method or whatever, and I don't know how to do that. Got it. So the Focus Compounding Daily that got sent out today, you can go to my Twitter at Focus Compound to get access to this. You could sign up to receive this in your email box at focuscompounding.com. Somebody asked you, how long do we need to know a company can last to be sure it will survive a shutdown? And your answer to that was, I don't think it's possible to calculate such a number with enough confidence to base a stock purchase on it. So yes. I'm curious about that because, I mean, what does one do, you know? Yeah, that's the question. Uh, what I've said before about it, which I think is true, is you have to assume recapitalization. And the reason why I say this is like, at this point, take the coronavirus stuff, we, um, even the highest estimates for the worst hit areas and stuff, we're talking about like 80% of the population has not been exposed to coronavirus, right? So if that's true, and you're not gonna have a vaccine for a very long time, then you have to assume there'll be further shutdowns at times. So, I mean, that doesn't mean there will be when I say you have to assume, but I'm saying you can't make an investment on the hope that something won't happen. You have to make an investment thinking, this is a very realistic possibility of what the future will be in the near term. So I can't buy a stock unless I will survive a shutdown of, the, you know, of this business. And I think the way that businesses will survive it is through recapitalization. I don't think that it's possible to think that they won't burn enough cash um, over time. They, there are some companies I've talked about their burn rates and stuff. I think I saw uh, Norwegian talk about what their burn rate is um, versus like uh, Carnival, I think, had said before what their burn rate was and things like that. But I think you have to assume more looking at the balance sheet and at the history of the company, uh, how much debt it could take on, how much stock it could issue. And that's what we've talked about before. And that's really what I think is the likelihood. So I think it doesn't make sense to do this calculation of like, okay, well, if they could last three months in a shutdown, let's say that things will shut down again in, uh, in the fall or something. Can they survive a shutdown in the last November, December, and January, and then things open up again in February. I don't know why those months would be the ones, but you know, um, I think that's hard to say. And I think it is 
going to be too hard for you because what number do you put in there? Why three months instead of six months? Why three months instead of one month or something like that, you know? And it's also, I think, difficult because the reaction could be extremely different this time, uh, next time, because people now have an awareness of what the costs are both, both economically and what the benefits are in terms of health stuff in the area. So governments might respond differently. Um, and the market will likely respond very differently in terms of how quickly it marks down the stock or the bonds or things like that. Um, so I really think you have to assume recapitalization. So you look at all these things like a, a distressed debt investor, or whatever you want to call it, um, someone who's looking at what will this be worth after it's recapitalized? What will this be worth after we put a lot of debt on and how much debt can be put on? What will it look like after we um, uh, dilute the stock a lot? And sometimes I think that means like, okay, what if we, it, what if there's a hundred million shares outstanding and we issued another hundred million shares? Uh, I, th there are stocks that get so cheap that that would still work out fine for you, you know, at their lows and stuff, things like Dave and Buster's and uh, cheesecake factory and uh, carnival and stuff. I think we're at prices where if they, you know, recapitalize by almost doubling their share count or something, I, I think they'd still could have worked out attractively as investments. So I would always look at it by getting out a piece of paper and trying to figure out what kind of recapitalization you think is realistic. Um, and then there's a question of whether that kind of recapitalization will be possible at the time when it's needed, which is more what worries me. Um, you know, we talked about that before, but making sure you want to tap markets uh, for, for debt and things like that when there's credit to be had and not when you need the credit. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. the company and the companies, yeah, they're, I guess, their general thoughts towards... Yeah, I mean, like capitalizing it, it, and raising it, debt, it, cash, everything. Yeah, if you just go quick FS for Carnival, type in Carnival so I can show you this. If you go to the balance sheet, yeah, if you go to the balance sheet, we could look there quickly. Okay, so if you look at the balance sheet, you can see shareholders' equity and you can see total assets and things like that, right? So their shareholders' equity at the end of 2019, it was at uh, 25 billion and retained earnings were 26 billion. So that was even. Uh, it, so it was fully funded and historically with retained earnings, right? Because they had bought back some stock too. So um, if we look, we can see that total liabilities were about twenty billion or something. Most of it in the form of long-term debt, and that the assets were all in the form of PP&E, which are basically ships. It also can be like dry docks and things like that. But so if you see that that amount is about twice the amount of total liabilities, right? And then you can see that the problem with the liabilities is a bunch of them were shorter term. Uh, versus having very few short-term current assets, but you have a huge amount of property versus your total liabilities, right? So you're trying to think, okay, what's the worst case scenario? Could we ever get to a situation where the fully depreciated value of the property and the liabilities basically match off? You know, like how much cushion do I have here? So if I had, you know, that much equity where I had 25 billion all in the form of really, for, not all, but largely in the form of tangible equity, you can see goodwill and other intangibles are, are a very small amount of it. Um, then can I borrow against all of that up to the point where I've replaced much of the capital structure with debt? Now, if we type in another one, you could try type in NCLH, I guess, is their number. Is there a ticker? Yeah. All right. So we look at their balance sheet, and then we can do the same sort of calculations here. So you see what their total liabilities are, right? And then you see their PP&E and all of that. You'll notice that although a lot of the structure is the same, it is a little worrying that the property plan and equipment is fairly small, I'd say, compared to the total liabilities, wouldn't you say? Uh -huh. So, for instance, they have almost the same amount of long-term debt as Carnival had going into this, uh, about $2 billion less. And yet their property plan and equipment is, what, um, almost a third of Carnival's? Yeah, yeah way less. So the, the ratio of like tangible assets that they had versus long-term debt is really strongly in the favor of um, Carnival versus Norwegian. And you can just see other things about the structure of their balance sheet that, that make it a little more questionable or whatever. That doesn't mean that they won't survive and that Carnival will or that they're not a better bet or whatever. But if I was looking at it just from the perspective of, okay, we got to recapitalize these things, which would be the first one I would look at. The first one I would look at is Carnival because I have a little more hope of, oh, we could put on a lot of debt onto this or we could put on a lot of whatever else. Now, the other way you can do it is, is income stuff. So if we go to like, uh, maybe the, yeah, we could do income statement, I guess. That's probably the best way to do this. So if we look at income statement, we can look at their historical operating profit, right? Mm -hmm. So recently their operating profit was about a billion, right? And then they have about, we said 6 billion or so in, in um, debt. Yep. Yeah. And then, and that's just, we're just using long-term debt and add together the other things. If we go to uh, CCL, same sheet, but CCL, yeah. 
we can see that in their last three years, they were at over 3 billion, right? And they'd actually done 4 billion in the trailing 12 months, right? Uh, yep. So it's just it's significantly more EBIT at the point at which they were earning uh, money versus their long-term debt than you have with Norwegian. So it would just say to me that Norwegian is closer to their capacity in terms of their, uh, their normal income to cover uh, debt that they have, interest payments and stuff. And they're closer to their kind of um, the headroom that they have and if you want to call it margin or whatever, that they have in terms of the value of their tangible assets. If you have a lot of tangible assets, you haven't yet um, uh, kind of matched off with debt, if you want to think of it that way. Or uh, you have a lot of uh, EBIT you used to have that wasn't being used on debt service, then I think you have more room to put on more debt. So just to me, it would seem that that um, Carnival had more room to put on more debt than Norwegian would. Uh, and so I looking at it from the perspective of there's going to have to be a lot more debt put on them. If you're looking at the common stock, which is the most junior, um, then you need all that debt to be good and stuff for you to make money. So you definitely want there to be a possibility for a lot of debt to be put ahead of you um, f- for the company to come out of this. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for sending in those questions or tweeting me the questions. Be on the lookout for it. I always tweet for a QA, and a call for questions on Mondays. If you're watching on YouTube and want to have a question asked or answered next week, feel free to leave a comment down below. I queue them and then we'll bring them up on the following Monday. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in. Hit that subscribe button, thumbs this video up. And then if you want to join the Focus Compound daily that we actually just went over, um, go to focuscompound.com and enter in your email for free. Jeff, good job out of you. We hope everyone has a great day and we will see you in the next podcast.